this episode, we're speaking to Professor Sarah Russell from the UK's Natural History Museum. Sarah is one of a handful of UK scientists who will be analysing samples of asteroid Bennu, which was returned to Earth by NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission. We got the chance to find out what sort of analysis she'll be conducting on the asteroid sample and what it could tell us about the history of our solar system. Hello, I'm Sarah Russell. I'm a planetary scientist at the Natural History Museum. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for coming on the podcast and speaking to me today. Today, we're talking sort of space rocks and asteroids and the fact that the Natural History Museum is among a handful, I suppose, of UK research centres that have have received a sample of asteroid Bennu, which was collected by the NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission. Before we sort of got onto the Bennu sample, I thought it'd be worth just covering. Why do we study space rocks? What what can they tell us about anything, I suppose, really? (laughs) Yeah, so we're really lucky at the museum. We've got a fantastic collection of space rocks, which all fell to Earth, nearly all of them, fell to Earth naturally as meteorites. And most of the meteorites that we have come from asteroids, but a handful come from the Moon, Uh, and a handful come from Mars. The asteroidal ones are really cool because uh, asteroids are four and a half billion years old. They form at the same time that the sun and the planets were forming. Um, But unlike the planets, which have undergone loads and loads of uh, geology and volcanoes and all sorts of things, the asteroids have remained the same pretty much the same state for four and a half billion years. So they give us a real kind of look back in time to the snapshots to help us understand how planets formed. But you sort of said nearly all of the space rocks have fallen to Earth, but I suppose the, the caveat there is the, the sample from Osiris Rex. Can you tell us a bit more about that and how you and, and the Natural History Museum came to be involved in that mission? Yeah, so OSIRIS-REx is a super exciting mission uh, that has been in the planning for many, many years, but it launched in 2016 from Cape Canaveral. Um, So I was lucky enough to actually go out there and watch it launch. It was so exciting. And um, we got involved because at the museum, we've been interested in a long time in these asteroidal meteorites that perhaps uh, resemble asteroids like Bennu, which was the target of the OSIRIS-REx mission. So Bennu is a very dark colored asteroid, and we think it's dark because it contains a lot of carbon. Uh, When the spacecraft went to visit it, it spent a couple of years uh, in uh, going round and round the asteroid, getting data from it, and it found out that it also looked like it contained water, um, which again is similar to many of the meteorites that we see in our collection that we've been working on. So for that reason, we were invited to get involved in uh, looking at the sample when it came back to Earth. So what was your involvement during the mission? Were UK facilities sort of consulted as to you know where the sample would be taken from and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's, yeah, there's a handful of uh, UK institutions that are involved in the mission. There's us at the Natural History Museum, there's the University of Manchester, there's the Open University and the University of Oxford. And at the University of Oxford in particular, um, they were quite heavily involved in that uh, part of the mission when the spacecraft was visiting the asteroid because they specialise in spectroscopy and looking at the composition of uh, the rock from from space. So they were heavily involved then. And to some extent, all the scientists were involved in deciding where we would collect the sample from that would return to Earth. And now you've been given a sample of of the asteroid. How much have you actually received? So we've received about a teaspoonful. So it's 100 milligrams. Um, So it turns out the asteroid is actually not very dense at all. So even though 100 milligrams doesn't sound like a lot, it sort of looks maybe more than you would expect. So yeah, it's a good teaspoonful, uh, a very, very dark, pretty fine grained uh, grains, grains of asteroid. So they are up to about a millimeter in size, the individual grains that we've got. And is there, well, presumably there is a huge difference between the sample collected by Bennu and and samples that would have fallen to Earth. Otherwise, the sample collection mission wouldn't have been carried out. Yeah, so there's a few reasons why it's good to actually go out in space and get a piece of asteroid and bring it back to Earth rather than just wait for your meteorite to fall. Um, So one of the reasons is when a meteorite falls, we very rarely know exactly where it's come from. So it's a bit of a guess, firstly, to find out what sort of body, whether it's an asteroid or a planet or a moon or whatever. Uh, And then also, once we know what if it's an asteroid, finding out exactly 
which asteroid it may have come from is always a bit of a puzzle. And an advantage of going out into space and collecting the sample is that you can do all of this um, like geological field work, looking at the asteroid in great detail so you can better understand the context of where the sample came from. And then asteroids like Bennu, are, um, they're actually, it's quite a kind of fragile, friable kind of rock. So it's it's actually quite rare for rocks like that to make it down to the Earth as, as meteorites. So uh, we see some that might be a little bit similar, but we haven't maybe seen one exactly the same in every respect. Um, and the other reason why it's great to have a sample return mission is that every meteorite that comes into Earth, as soon as it enters the Earth's atmosphere, it starts exchanging with the air around us. When it lands on the ground, it might get wet. It might have worms crawling on it. All of those things are contaminating it. But if we bring it back from a spacecraft, then that means we can keep it pristine. And so um, the, our sample is kept in a nitrogen glove box. It's never seen oxygen from the air. That is so cool. I mean, it does sound quite sort of futuristic, doesn't it? You know, it, a spacecraft traveling out and grabbing a bit of an asteroid and bringing it back. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. It's it's such an ambitious uh, project. It's just incredible that humans can do this. I'm really in awe of all of the uh, engineers that got us to this point. Absolutely. So now that you've got it, what will you be doing with it? What sort of tests do you carry out? Yeah, so at our museum, we specialize in mineralogy. So we're going to be looking at exactly what the rock is made of. Uh, we're going to be using um, a type of instrument called XRD, X-ray diffraction, um, which will look at the structure of the crystals inside the rock. Um, we're going to do CT scanning on each grain, individual grain, which tells us what the internal structure looks like, the same way a medical CT scanner works. Uh, and then we're going to put it in our electron microscopes to look at it in great detail. And that will also tell us what uh, the chemistry of the sample is. So we're going to have a whole battery of tests. And most of these things are actually non-destructive. So that means that once we're done doing this, they can then be maybe passed on to other labs for other work that might be more destructive. How do you manage to do all that but not expose it to oxygen? Uh, yes. Yeah, so... Uh, unfortunately, we can't keep it kind of in its lovely, pristine nitrogen glove box uh, forever because a lot of our um, instruments, we need to take it to air to like put it in the instruments. So each, um, so the grains are the grains that come out to analyze will will actually be exposed to air as they come out. But the main part of the sample we're keeping in nitrogen as much as possible. And also, you said there that you'll be examining it grain by grain. I mean, yeah. how, how do you actually do that? Is it sort of like you can sort of imagine like a scientist with like tweezers having to, you know, edge out tiny, tiny grains? And presumably that would take a, a very, very long time. How long do you sort of expect, for example, you, your specific sample to be analysed for? Um, so I uh, so the, the sample analysis part of the mission is uh, due to last about two years. And I think that's a fairly um, good estimate of the amount of time we're going to be working on it. Um, but then, of course, yeah, it's going to be pieces will be kept in per perpetuity as well for future generations to be able to use. But yeah, it takes a long time. So that's exactly right. So we are picking the grains out grain by grain using tweezers. Sometimes even tweezers are too coarse. So we're just using a little needle to get it like stuck to the tip of the needle and try and moving it around that way. But yeah, it requires a very steady hand. Which my hands aren't the steadiest, I have to say. But um, yeah, Re requires good eyes, steady hands, and strong nerves. And is there anything that you're expecting or hoping to find? So what we're hoping to find is that um, Bennu might be one of the most volatile rich objects that we've had to study on the Earth, um, extraterrestrial materials that we've had to study on the Earth. So because the asteroid looks like it contains lots of carbon and lots of water, um, it's very has a very low density, and um, so what we're expecting or hoping to find is that it will be it, it, that it probably accreted further out in the solar system in a place that's much colder because it's further away from the sun and accreted with ices and organic material, and um, 
Then it was transported into the innermost part of the solar system that was a, a little bit hotter, but it's, it's kept this primordial composition. Uh, and we're really interested in that because it could be that asteroids like Bennu actually uh, impacted the early Earth and brought the carbon and water that we needed to create our habitable planet. Well, that's uh, that's incredible. Could it potentially tell us anything about like the rest of the solar system, the formation and the history of our solar system as well? Yeah, so, well, uh, so we think that that um, Bennu may contain grains that were uh, actually formed in the protoplanetary disk, so formed inside the dusty disk from which our sun and the planets formed. Um, and uh, by looking at these individual little grains, we can find out things like what the uh, pressure, the temperature, composition, the time scales of the protoplanetary disk were, uh, and we can learn something about whether things moved around that disk very much from the innermost part to the outermost part or, or back again. Uh, so those are the, some of the things that we're going to be trying to look at using this sample. And with regard to, to other sample collection missions like Hayabusa 2 for example is there a, presumably there's a, a sort of collaboration between results and and you sort of compare results and what does that tell you yeah so Hayabusa 2 was the first um sample return mission to a primitive asteroid that looks a little bit like Bennu one of these dark C type asteroids and um the Osiris Rex team call Hayabusa 2 their sister mission and there's going to be a lot of comparisons of the samples that were brought back we're incredibly lucky to be you know working at this time when there are these two missions that both went to, to these amazing asteroids and brought material back and of course Hayabusa 2 was was on the back of Hayabusa 1 uh, the first ever asteroid sample return that went to the S type asteroid Itakawa um, so we've, we've we've suddenly got all of this exciting material to to study and to compare. Uh, so one of the things we want to look at is the diversity of asteroidal material that's out there, and uh, that will help us look in a little bit more detail at exactly what might have been um, impacting the Earth and contributing to uh, the Earth as it was growing and in its later stages of, of formation. You've also worked on moon rocks, as I understand it. Um, do you compare the sample collection missions from asteroids to, for example, like the moon samples brought back by the Apollo missions and, and things like that? And can that tell you anything? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things asteroids and our moon have in common is that they're both airless bodies and um, they have both been um, subject to what's called space weathering, which is the interaction of energetic particles on the surface uh, of the body. And one of the things we can compare the asteroid rocks, which were returned from the very, we know they were returned from the very surface of the asteroid, from the lunar rocks, which were also very much surface rocks. We know that they were surface rocks. We can compare them to look at um, how they're they, they've been differently or similarly space weathered, which can help us understand how uh, rocks interact with their environment and exchange with their, their space environment. And obviously you're primarily concerned with asteroid Benny at the moment, but do you think about potential future missions? I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if we could do like a sample collection mission, like for the Kuiper Belt or something like that? Yeah. Do you sort of think about future targets, even within the asteroid belt or, or beyond? Absolutely. And so it would be fantastic to, there are so many places to go. And I think, um, yeah, minor bodies in the solar system are very much neglected, but they're an incredibly diverse group of material of objects. And, and we're only scratching the surface of, of, of what we know about them. So uh, some asteroids seem to be made mostly of metal, for example, it'd be great to bring that back down to Earth. There are the E-type asteroids, which may be inner solar system type asteroids. They may have made really important contribution to uh, the material that, that accreted to form the Earth. So they would be great to have a closer look at. And then, of course, as you say, Kuiper Belt objects are amazing. It would be incredible to go out there and 
collect an icy world. And I guess the dream would be to try to bring it back with its ice intact so we could study the ice the same way that we study our rocks. So look at exactly what that crystal structure is, for example, and how the rock and ice are interacting with each other. That would be amazing. And then perhaps the ultimate dream is if we could one day capture a bit of an interstellar asteroid that's a, a, you know, an interloper that comes into our solar system. And that might help tell us something about worlds even beyond our solar system <laughs> so yeah that's that's all a bit uh, sci-fi at the moment but there's one incredible mission that is definitely going to happen which is called uh, mmx so this is the next japanese sample return mission and that's going to collect a piece of uh, mars's moon phobos so that's a really exciting mission as well because currently we don't really know how phobos formed or it might be a captured asteroid, or it may have formed by an impact into Mars's surface. So there's still like so much to learn about it. Well, that's really, really exciting. I mean, missions to look forward to, I suppose. But coming back to asteroid Bennu, I'm led to believe that the findings are going to be presented in March of 2024. Is that right? Is that sort of the time that you've got to make and present your, your initial findings? Yes, exactly. That's, so that's our target at the moment. There's a big conference in Houston every year called the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. So this conference started the year after um, rocks were brought back from the moon, and it's been going every year since. And uh, that's where the first data from OSIRIS-REx will be presented. So we're working towards the target of presenting there. Amazing. Well, I'll definitely look forward to that. And sure, maybe we could we could catch up later on in uh, 2024 and, you know, to discuss the findings and, and how things are going. If you're up That'd for that. brilliant, Ian. Yeah, absolutely. So up for that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks for coming on the podcast and letting us know. And, you know, good luck with your research and your analysis of, of Benny and hope to speak to you again soon. Great. Thank you very much, Ian. It's really nice to talk to you.